Um, well, once again, I start a podcast recording with an apology uh, because, again, my guest has been very patient with my uh, scheduling challenges, uh, but delighted to be joined by uh, Troy Erdahl. Well, we've just been going through the pronunciation of that. Um, maybe we'll even talk about where it comes from. But Troy, glad to have you here. Um, glad we're having a conversation and uh, it'd be great to maybe just Tell me your story. Tell me how you got involved in this whole game in the first place. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the for the opportunity. Sports have been an enormous part of my life ever since uh, I was a child. My my grandfather's a Hall of Fame teacher coach. My father's a Hall of Fame teacher coach. So whether I ever wanted to get involved in sports or not, it was probably preordained that I would be involved in some way. I'm the youngest of three boys and. It's how we spent our time as kids. And I think how we did that looks very different than kids today. Uh, I grew up in the middle of farm country, in the middle of Minnesota and the States, uh, right across a dirt road was a cornfield. And we spent our days playing. I was lucky enough in high school to play three sports. I was a football, hockey, baseball guy um, in American football. And then in, in college, I was able to play the same sports. Uh, I, I think it was in college when I realized, you know, I, I love sports. I, I love education. Um, I, I, was, I still have a, a passion for history. And it made total sense that I would continue doing that. And so I uh, pursued an education in, in teaching and coaching and was lucky enough to find a wonderful mentor and coach who took me on as, as a young head coach and have been a, a high school baseball coach for the last 25 years. Along the way, some different job changes within the same building, uh, but I'm the activities director now and I've been the activities director for the last 20 years. That means I help coordinate all of our coaches and all of our, and all of our programs. Through doing that, I've had some wonderful experiences in Usually it's been from raising my hand, just by volunteering and, and putting myself out there. I've been able to serve in a number of different capacities for some of our local and national organizations. I was able to, I've been able to coach internationally uh, and I was able to, to, to write a book about coaching and leadership. So it really has defined and then redefined and continues to sharpen who I am and the life I live as a, as a person and as a leader. Well, I've, I've really, I've really enjoyed the book, and I'm definitely keen to talk about it in, uh, in a little bit. But um, before we get into that, I, um, I was interested that you're one of the few uh, athletes that managed to stay multi-sport through high school and into college. Like normally, you have to specialize, don't you? It, it's becoming the norm, <laughs> without question. It's becoming the norm, and I don't, I don't think that's a good norm. Uh, mm -hmm. It. It's the way it is, uh, and and I think that um, it's a malservice to our youth and to our to our kids and athletes, uh, and to our coaches uh, to push a single sport or a single program. I think we're seeing more injuries because of it. Um, I, I think we're seeing a, a reduction in athleticism, and I actually think that we're seeing a lesser or poorer quality of play because of it. We just have less less people participating now. And that's, that's I think, creating a, a, a wider gap between the elite, the best of the best, and then the average. I, I think that gap continues to grow in large part because of specialization. Mm. Um, also, um, you, you mentioned that you're an activities director. How many coaches and or staff do you have under your card? We're a pretty mid-sized public high school where I'm coming from. Um, and so we're about 700, 750 students in grades nine through 12. Um, so pretty mid-sized, but we offer about as many programs as most larger schools would. Uh, and so in our instance, between paid and volunteer coaches, we're probably around 75 to 80, something like that. Um, and then probably about uh, two thirds of that would be paid staff. So around, wow. around 50 paid staff members. And then how many sports are you offering? 27 sport programs. Just amazing. I have to say, like, it never seeks 
it ceases to amaze me. I I love hearing about kind of the way sports organized uh, in the US. Um, you know, our schools just don't have anything like that kind of. Uh, okay, that's not quite true. The private ones, the fee paying uh, would be. Uh, they'd have more like that kind of level of staffing, but um, certainly not in the in the public schools. It's generally speaking done by the teachers who are doing stuff sort of you know out of school hours, so to speak. But uh, yeah, amazing. I mean, activities director. It's a wonderful like a, model. It's a wonderful oh, I was model. Say, activities yeah. director sounds like the best job in the world. I actually use that line. I, I do say that, that it is the best job in the world. And I, I say that about coaching too, um, when it's done right. And when it's done right, it is. It can also be the most difficult and frustrating job in the world. Uh, but when you have your priorities straight and when you are operating from, from purpose and when things are going well, it is the greatest job in the world. So t tell me that. Um, that so that's an interesting conversation, I think. And I think one of the things that people struggle with the most, I struggle with this a little bit uh, as a kind of, you know, I'm the managing director of a community sports club or a single sport club. And I've got, what have I got now? 15, 20 coaches sort of under, under my kind of umbrella. Uh, some of them are lead coaches. Not all of them necessarily have the same philosophy. And sometimes that can be a little bit challenging. Um, how do you deal with that uh, sort of diversity? I'm not to say diversity is wrong, by the way, but sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes things can be misaligned, shall we say, culturally, and then that can be a little bit destabilizing. So how do you deal with that kind of dynamic? There's a lot of angles on that question. It's a really <laughs> good question. Uh, and it's, in fairness, probably where much of my career's work has been, because what you're talking about is also culture. Uh, mm. I think it all begins with understanding our why and knowing our purpose and why we're coaching. I, I think that's where it begins and, and why we exist. I mentioned a second ago the advantage of the system that the states has. And when I say the advantage, there are certainly um, there are certainly some difficulties as well. But one advantage, without question, is that we're tied to an educational mission of a school. Therefore, our programs in my view, and I'm not saying that this is viewed the same way everywhere, in my view, are teaching and learning just like a classroom, and that our coaches are teachers, and that our athletes are learners. And when you approach it that way, and when your purpose, in my case, my purpose, why I show up every day in the job I do, is to make the world a better place through sports. Because I truly believe that if we do it right, we can make the world a better place through sports. And I do that by working alongside others to fulfill their purpose. Because in I can't do it alone, right? That would be silly. None of us can do it alone. And so it's about building that culture, about what we do prioritize and what is most significant and what is most important to us. I think if we don't ask that question and if we don't have that conversation, the, the fill in the blank answer becomes winning. And for me, it's so much more than that. Um, as coaches, we're the most competitive people in the world. We want to win so badly. Uh, but that has to that that can be a start. That, that, that can't be an end. That that can't be an end. So um, when you talk about goals, winning is always going to be there. But when you talk about why we exist and what our function is and what our purpose is, it needs to be something deeper and something greater. And so collectively, our school and our coaches work to capture the heart of every one of our athletes. That's what they do. They well, they want to capture the heart. And when I say that, they're teaching the life skills of hard work, empathy, attitude, respect, and teamwork, that's Bill's heart. Uh, but they're also focused on the relationship because they know that the impact that they have on their athletes probably isn't going to be seen for years or even decades. And as we talk about the critical mass, you know, we want to coach all 100%. We don't just want that 97% who aren't going to go play a college sport or go play professionally. Um, and we don't want just that 3% that we're trying to connect with and build that relationship and ultimately build the life skills that are going to help them for the rest of their life because we're connected to teaching and learning. I love that acronym heart. Did I, did, did I miss that in the book? Is that in the book? Yeah, it's in there. Yep. Uh, I think I did. I, I, I thought I'd there's seen a lot it. in there. Yep. There's a <laughs> lot in there. I thought I'd seen it. Um, and is that just something that you came up with? Is it a school credo or is it just something that you've lived by? All of it. 
All, All of it. it. Okay. Yep. Right. That is our collective purpose. So as a as a school, we embrace that. And as a matter of fact, I probably have a nice shirt somewhere right around here that all of our staff has that has that logo on it um, to capture the heart of all of our participants. Uh, certainly, as a leader, it's something that you need to live in and model, and it's something I connect very personally with, uh, and it's something I think that has changed in me and I've learned over time, maybe it's become more intentionality or more purposeful, the understanding. And I think that's the pedagogical change in coaching that we've seen throughout generations. Uh, and, and we st still see relics of it today. But I think now in 2024, we understand and realize that we need to have relationships with our athletes and we need to have connections with our athletes and our athletes want that. Uh, so whether the coach wants it or not, it's what the what our athletes want. Love that, love that. Well, we've already segued into the book, which is great. Um, and actually, the the place I was going to start was this notion of finding your why. So obviously, one of the things I like actually about the book is, um, and I'm going to shamelessly like plagiarize the life out of these. Is you start in every chapter with a really nice quote. Um, you obviously got one from Carl Rogers here: "A good life is a process, not a state of being. It is a direction, not a destination." So I really like that, and I think it sets up this notion of um, finding your why. But before I delve into the specific chapters, just talk to me about the genesis of the book and kind of what was your driver for creating it and what are your hopes for it uh, in terms of, I think you probably had an audience in mind, so I'd be interested in, in hearing about that. I never thought I'd write a book. I, I never thought I would. Um, however, for the 20 years that, I've served as an activities director, we've always been very intentional about using life lessons to to learn through sport. And, and so we've done weekly lessons where as the activities director, I would work with our coaches and our coaches would work with their, with their athletes about specific themes and lessons to learn from. So without really knowing it, over the course of 20 years, I was building a pretty extensive library of lessons. And it was when I was sitting... Um, when I was sitting, it kind of, when COVID had that lapse, I don't know if lapse is the right word, but when we were finally able, able to travel again, when when the lockdowns started to let up a little bit, uh, my family took, um, we were really excited to take a trip together and, and we went uh, to Mexico. And it was on the beaches of Mexico where I got this idea of, wow, if, if I had the right transformational coach, I could start weaving these stories together. And then as I was reading another book, I was reminded that uh, a mentoring figure of mine had actually batted against Satchel Paige when he, when he was younger. And so the legendary Negro League player and then Major League Baseball player, Satchel Paige, he had played against him. And I thought, well, he has a really neat story. Maybe if I take a fictionalized version of him, he could be that transformational coach that carries, that's the thread that carries the story through. Well, lo and behold, I end up getting quarantined in Mexico. So I got COVID somewhere along the way in that week, and I and I got um, stuck in a hotel room without my family. They they were clear. They didn't uh, they didn't test positive, and so they went home. And I spent a week outlining what it could look like and what it could become. Uh, in the end, you know, I couldn't be happier with the the product. And what I was trying to do ultimately is sport. And so many mentoring and caring figures have given so much to me in my life. If in just some small way I could give back, it was going to be a success. And, and um, happy to say, like I just got a card in the mail yesterday from someone I don't know about the impact that um, the book had on him and his coaching. That that all by itself is success for me. Yeah, I mean, you can tell it's written like that, and 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 that one of the things I was going to say is. The um, method of essentially using storytelling or parable as a way of getting across a message, you know, that, that's a way humans have learned through the millennia. Um, so in lots of ways, that's what makes it so engaging. Um, it made it difficult for me with my ADHD because I couldn't like, I didn't know where to start first. So I read the book like I always read any book, if I'm, I'm, if I'm honest, which is I, I jump around a little bit. So if you've spent hours and hours crafting this lovely narrative thread and I've ruined it by jumping around, I do apologize. But 
I, nonetheless, I still enjoyed it. <laughs> well, and I think that's to the the question that you ask. I think that's part of the answer is um, we have a lot of technical coaching and leadership books. Uh, there's a lot out there on that. It is a narrative version of telling the story of how um, a caring person can change the lives of others. It's also a book for anyone who's interested about leading self. And, and so in terms of um, narrowing down the target audience, it, it's actually a, a hard question for me because I think anyone who wishes to make a positive difference in the life of another person would benefit from it. I also think anyone who enjoys history, who enjoys stories, who enjoys uh, parables would would find value in it and would be entertained by its story. Um, and so, it, it you know, it says transformational coaching to build champions for life. It certainly is and does have a coaching target, probably is the main target, uh, but it's much broader than that. And that, I have a 80-year-old former colleague that's coming in later to grab a dozen copies that she's going to sell at her craft fair just to <laughs> do because she loved it so much. Uh, I have a former athlete who is 14 years old who sent me a text message how much how much he enjoyed the stories. So from you know teenagers to seniors, uh, that has been the part that has really been heartwarming for me is that's connected with a wide range of audience. Mm. Well, I mean, to be honest, it's one of the things I really liked about it, and I I almost think it's one of those books that you you want to recommend to anybody starting out in their journey of coaching because a lot of the stories really speak to the impact that coaches or people in coaching roles can have on others so if you wanted to it's almost like a recruitment manual <laughs> like if anyone was sort of mm, should i become a coach read this i'm definitely going to become a coach <laughs> and it's built on the life skills that you can teach and learn through sport that, that's what the chapter organization is is exactly that and when i talked before about why we get into this and ultimately what are we trying to do uh there's certainly elements of competition into it but Stuart, you're right like for a new coach or for someone revisiting why they are coaching mm. it, it's great to sharpen that saw or that blade of man am i lucky i, I have the greatest job in the world there's um that fantastic um, Billy Graham quote that one coach will positively influence more people in a lifetime than the average person will uh, in one year. The the average coach will positively influence more people in one year than the average person will in a lifetime. The amount of impact that we can make through coaching is, is pretty awesome. And so that, w that was part of it. And if someone has changed through their coaching by reading it, like I said, that's uh, that was the hope. Love that. Love that. Um, so I started with Finding Your Why, so we'll just circle back to that one. Um, obviously, you know, there's been a lot said about Finding Your Why with the success and pos and popularity of Simon Sinek. It's something I talk about a lot. A question I actually ask whenever I'm in front of a group of coaches of any size is, why do you coach the way you coach? Um, sometimes clarified as, why do you do what you do the way that you do it? Um but I actually do think it's an important question. And it's amazing to me that actually how few people have ever really fully kind of examined their why. Um, very often they just go towards, uh, oh, I do it because this is this is how I somebody else did it and I'm following their footsteps. Or this is how somebody did it and I didn't like it, so I'm doing something else. But never really fully examined it from their own purpose perspective. So um, just if you wouldn't mind, let's start there because I think there's so much we could unpack. Well, in the foundational book for me in my leadership and coaching journey was Joe Ehrman's Inside Out Coaching. And I've been really lucky to have Joe as a mentor of mine, and I've been able to work very closely with him on a number of trainings at the national level. Uh, and in Inside Out Coaching, Ehrman, and, and Joe is nice enough to write the forward to my book as well. Uh, he asks, why do you coach? Why do you coach the way you do? How does it feel to be coached by you? And then how do you define success? Those are, they seem so simple. They're one sentence questions that uh, that we use in interviews. So if I'm interviewing a new coach, um, those, are the those are four of the questions that I'll use. And to your point, Stuart, lots of times people can talk around it. Like they can, they can talk around it, but have a real hard time getting right to it and answering it um, and, and understanding that why we coach 
the way we do is influenced usually by our past experiences. And some of that is really a subconscious level that we can, through reflection, begin to understand. I think for anyone watching or listening who who has gone through this before, they'll know exactly what I'm saying. If you've ever had that moment of, oh my goodness, I was just my mother, or I was just my father, uh, or in the coaching world, I just did what Coach Blank did. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. Um, and for all of us to have the wherewithal and, and knowledge to know, you know, if it is bad, okay, let's do something different. Let's maybe even pause and, and start over. Um, because if it's an experience that we didn't appreciate, enjoy, or wasn't helpful or useful or didn't build into us, it's not an experience or it's not um, a behavior that we should be replicating or repeating. Uh, for me, how it feels to be coached by me, I, I think it's all about, I think we need both high expectations and accountability, and we need high care and high support. And I think this is where many coaches get tripped up. We have so many coaches who are all about expectations and accountability, and they just live on that side of the continuum. Uh, and then increasingly, and I think this is a positive change, we're getting more care and support into coaching. But you need both. It's not one or the other. If you're just if you're just caring and just supportive, and it's tough to say just because that's a good thing to be caring and supportive, but if that's all you focus on, you're a nice coach. If you are only expectations and accountability, you're just coaching angry or you're just coaching mean. And so our athletes need to know that we are going to push them to the greatest levels and heights that we possibly can. And we're going to be pushing them every step of the way. But every time they need that care and support and help to get there, that their coach will be there for them. And so, you know, I've had the great opportunity to think a lot about those significant and important questions. And I encourage every coach, they should have good answers and they should be able to know um, what their why is, why they coach the way they do, how it feels to be coached by them, and, and ultimately, what will success look like for you? Yeah. I mean, that, that that's something that I think is so kind of impactful for so many. Um, that examination, um, like you say, I actually like those other questions. What ha, That's another, another element that I haven't thought about. What does it feel like to be coached by you? That's a profound question. I'd be in... <laughs> I just think in my early days, like if I had to come for an interview with you and you'd ask me those questions, how would I have answered them? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, my my son is a 12th grader. He's a senior uh, and he's considering playing college sports and he's trying to find that right fit. Um, he won't be playing. He's not a division one athlete, but he's a nice athlete who is looking to play at the next level in college or considering it. When when he's been connecting with coaches, I'm so proud of him for this. That's actually a question that he's asked college coaches who have been doing it for decades. Like, how does it feel to be coached by you? And it's amazing how difficult it is for some coaches who have been doing it for decades, I mean, career coaches, to answer that question. And it's been really interesting to see uh, mm. him ask it and then the answers he gets. And he's not trying to trip him up. He means it. I mean, it's not a guy. Uh, yeah, or anything like that. He he really wants to know, and in part, it's the culture he's grown up in. They're like, if I'm coming here, what's it going to feel like to be coached by you? How will that feel? Uh, and I think that's an important question to ask. Love that. I love that. Also, I I like what you talked about about this idea. You know, the high expectations and accountability and high support. You reminded me, guest I had on the podcast, uh, Mustafa Saka, who has a re research framework about that, about you know the creation of a kind of a positive and thriving environment and that's exactly what he talks about the idea of high high challenge high support and often it's about yep. whenever it whenever it's about high expectations high support high challenge sorry high expectations high accountability high challenge but the support isn't there that's when nowadays you're seeing athletes struggle you're seeing athletes you know, kind of essentially kicking back, pushing back and, and, and kind of challenging back, if you like, to a certain extent. And uh, there's almost a reappraisal going on, but it's not a reappraisal. Really what it's saying is, is that actually coaches, like you say, coaches who are just about meanness, that they're going to find themselves having a harder and harder time getting performances from athletes who nowadays I think deserve and demand more. Absolutely. So true. Yep, it's not, it's not a one or the other. It's both. No. So there's a lovely little story um, that I got immediately jumped to. I'm jumping around a little bit, but 
you talk about resilience, a little past flat, right? Mm. <laughs> now, I don't know if you remember this story. I mean, I bookmarked it because I thought it was really funny. I kind of kind of like reading it because, um, it's, again, it's like a little parable. Uh, parable. I don't know whether you want to tell it or you want me to read it for you, but go, you go tell it for me because it's great. It's one of my favorites too. And it comes, it actually comes from a cartoon. And so it originally it comes from an image and a traveler is walking down the path and comes across a wise sage. And there's a fork in the road and the, the traveler asks the sage, which way to success? Like the, this wise person, the one question that uh, he gets asked is the traveler, where's success? He's looking for success. And the sage points. Traveler walks down the path. There's a loud noise, a lot of commotion. The haggard traveler comes back and says, I, I think there's a problem here. You pointed this way. I went that way. And, and, and I just got all beat up doing it. You know, which way to success? And the the wise sage points the same direction again. And so a little bit questioning, the traveler goes down the path again. And there are loud noise and a loud splat in the, in the you know, the the traveler, it's even a more dramatic experience of getting beat up and pounded up and, and, and comes back to the sage again and says, look, you're supposed to know everything. And I just asked you which way to success. And you pointed that way. I want to know. Now tell me where is success? And the sage just uh, looked back and said, same direction, just a little past splat. And I think that's a great story for what all of us go through in life. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I really liked it because, I mean, I, I'm definitely going to have to use that. But that notion that uh, too often we can experience difficulty and challenge and recoil from it, when in actual fact, what we ought and need to do is to lean into it on the basis that there's usually some growth that comes from that. You've reminded me, by the way, of... um. I was very fortunate to meet Professor Carol Dweck once, mm -hmm. um, organized a conference over here, and we managed to get her to be our keynote speaker. And I mean, she must, she can't be any, she can't be more than five feet tall. Um, and, you know, first saw her and was like, oh my God. And like, I'm going to send her into this room of, you know, kind of like, you know, hard faced rugby players. How's this going to go? And of course, she's an absolute rock star, isn't she? And she said something similar, which was this idea of, she said, nobody comes home funny, amazing struggle today. And like the whole room went silent. <laughs> There's something just really profound been said. And I remember, like I said, it stuck with me. You know, I told that story several times, but it's a similar message, I suppose, isn't it? Which is the struggle is where the growth comes from. And you know, I'm, I'm half Finnish. Uh, so my mother is 100% Finnish. And the Finns, very proud people, they embody this concept of Sisu. And um, they sometimes privatize it. Uh, but as a, as a half Finn, I feel like I'm qualified to tell it. it. It doesn't have a great English translation, but it ties into this idea of grit and resilience. Uh, Sisu is that unrelenting determination, grit, will, um, in the in the face of insurmountable odds that they will never ever ever give up no matter what it is and you, you we saw this play out in the winter war of world war ii where uh, the outnumbered finns were able to take on the russians the soviet union and one of the most powerful militaries in the world and just on skis and through sisu uh, were able to defend their country. And and so they embody that concept. And I have a sign in my in my office that says Sisu. And for me, it's above my door because it's a reminder of always sometimes saying no can be so easy, but find the harder yes. Like find a way to get it done. Don't giving up's easy. Not giving up is is the hard part. Uh, and it's, I think a lot of people have that flipped. <laughs> They're like, ah, I'm, you know, so not giving up is, is really where the work comes in. Um, anyone can give up, right? Uh, and so for us to train ourselves and train others and to embody that that notion or idea of Sisu, that it's going to take more than that and to have the unending guts and strength to carry on. Um, 
I love that, feeling that. C2, that's great. It's a movie by the same name as a World War II movie, I think, by the same name. It's pretty gory, but um, similar. Yeah. I think and now I realize why it's called C2, because the whole message is perseverance and determination despite insurmountable odds. Yep. <laughs> love that. Um, uh, where to next? So um, now this is something that I was really drawn to because I think this notion of um, is really important. So you've got a particular chapter where you talk about allyship, and I think this is an, a really important element that I re I'm really interested in. So I am trying um, to uh, practice allyship in a lot of different domains with a lot of the work that I do with particularly with some marginalized or underrepresented groups and to try and do as much as I can to be an ally, sometimes in very difficult circumstances, I don't mind telling you. Uh, I love this notion, so I wouldn't wonder if I could get you to expand on that. Yeah, for better or worse, society has reflected sport so often. And so we've seen, you know, we've seen humanity at its worst in sport. And we've, I think, also seen humanity at its finest in sport. You know, you think back to some of the most galvanizing moments in American history, for sure. Post 9-11, um, if you remember at that time as President uh, Bush coming out to throw the first pitch at the Yankees game, I mean, that was an emotional moment that decades later, people still get choked up about um, as the reaction and, and him showing at that moment, a country that we will be strong and we will be resilient. Um, not all of our stories are that wonderful. And in the case of like Major League Baseball, not having through gentlemen's agreements, not allowing black players, some of the best players in the world, access to the game simply because of the color of their skin. And so I think back to the platform that we have through sports, we can teach some of the most significant and most important lessons about how we can be greater contributors to the world and how we, at a more micro level, work with the people next to us and work with them at the human level. Um, that much of the stories from the book, many of them, uh, and I call it historical fiction or narrative nonfiction um, a lot of times because the the lessons are real and many of them have been have been flipped around or twisted or or changed in in small ways, um, so it's not necessarily a biography uh, or straight nonfiction. In the case of allyship, it's where I did learn to work with people that didn't look like me. It's where I did see the first real examples of terrible, awful over racism. Uh, and one of the stories that I was there for that I tell in the book is um, when a very good friend of mine had someone from another dugout, he happened to be uh, uh, Hispanic in descent, and someone yelled at him to go back to the canning factory. Uh, and that has stuck with me for the rest of my life, um, that that A happens in sport. And then part of it, and we cover this in the book, is it almost became a fight on the, on the field at that point. But we never really talked about that. Uh, you know, there was never really any type of uh, debrief on that and how terrible and awful that was. Now, I'm thankful that my teammate and all of that team were there to defend and support their friend in that time. Um, but, you know, there are so many, unfortunately, I, I'm guessing for many people listening, they probably roll back their tapes of really bad moments that happen through sport. Uh, and so when I talk about the power of sport and the significance of sport, it can be good or bad. And really it's about the leader and the coach in terms of the direction it goes. And that's the significance of um of us as leaders and coaches to make sure that we're taking the opportunity that we are learning about others and that we are embracing and supporting no matter what someone looks like, uh, what their preference is, uh, or any other way that the world might define them, that they're a teammate. And as teammates, we have an obligation uh, to support and, and respect each other. Mm -hmm. And I'll extend that to the other team as well. Uh, and we can learn that lesson so powerfully through sport. When I talk about the difference between a classroom environment and a sport environment, we can talk about it all day long in the classroom. You can practice it 
in sport. And I think that's where um, where sport is so important to society is we can practice these really important, significant things, sometimes without even knowing it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important area and I'm glad you touched on it because a lot of people would have been afraid to, um, you know, because it can be a bit of a toxic sort of subject, can't it? Um, but it's one that needs talking about and I don't think enough people are talking about it. And I actually think from a coaching perspective, it's an area that, you know, would challenge many coaches. Like, what do you do in that circumstance? How do you handle the fallout? How do you deal with the time at the, you know, the the raw emotion at the time and the impact that that has? And how do you then deal and support the individuals that are affected? Because it wouldn't just necessarily be that individual that's affected. It would also be the people around them that are affected. And again, that that's a really important uh thing and you reminded me when you were talking about you know sport being neither good nor bad uh, everyone assumes and you know the general thesis of the book is about the power of sport and that the opportunities it provides and the lessons it can teach and the way that coaches can play the role in that and i think that's a really powerful message but as we know the reverse can very easily be true and um you may have heard of a, a guy called john amici he was probably one of the first um, British uh, basketballers who ever played in the NBA. And he's now become a, I don't even know quite how to describe him. He's um, he's uh, He's got his own kind of like performance consultancy and he talks a lot about, not just sport actually, he works in a lot of things. And he's become a very, very outspoken advocate on things like racism. He talks a lot about inclusion and allyship and all these notions. But he says a lot, actually, about how he challenges those of us who work in the sports space, who love to buy into the sort of positive narrative around sport. He says, you know, like sport is neutral. Mm -hmm. It's neither good nor bad in its, in and of itself. It's the people and what they do in it that makes it either a positive or a negative experience. And that's where the notion of allyship comes in. There's research that supports that, obviously. And research shows that the farther along in sport you get, the more morally corrupt it becomes. So mm -hmm. the higher levels you get, the more issues of ethics and, and morals we face. And so, you know, that's part of the problem. The longer that you're in sport, the more potential you have to be exposed to some of the ugly negative sides um, that have and can exist. Yeah, yeah, totally with you on that. Um. Right next to this chapter is this notion of taking off the dirt. I'm really interested in this area. You tell a story about John Tid Tidwell. Um, quite like this one. So um, tell me the story of John Tid Tidwell, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, and, and he's that guy that isn't the star athlete, but he was that one that lifts up others around him. And I think that's one of the most important life skills that any of us can possibly, uh, possibly have. And as we talk about the numbers, you know, beyond – adolescents, whatever percentage go on to play a next level, it's, you know, probably below 5% or something like that. I think one of the greatest skills that we see is your ability. It's one thing to lift yourself up and to make yourself great. It's a wonderful life skill. All of us should work on that each and every day. But if you can lift 5, 10, 15 people up, those are the people that go on to be CEOs. And those are the people that go on to lead nonprofits and to really make their mark in the world. And and I think you get to practice that through sport. Uh, the Shake It Off story is a great one because um, Tids is at the mound as he's listening to um, Coach tell this bizarre story that pitchers struggling, can't seem to find the strike zone for the life of them. Um, and he asks if he's uh, heard the story about the donkey in the well. And it's the old parable of the donkey gets stuck in the well and the neighbors come over and they start shoveling dirt on top of it because it's an old donkey and it's really too bad, but there's no way of getting the donkey out. And so it's time to send the donkey out to pasture um, in a figurative sense. And so they're shoveling the dirt on and the, do the donkey just starts stepping up and shaking off the dirt. And then eventually they fill the well with dirt and the donkey jumps out and he's renewed, right? He's saved. Um, and it's another wonderful example and story for all of us about sometimes just shaking it off that the only one in the world that gets to influence our attitude and our mood is ourself. Now, we have all kinds of external factors coming at us all the time. And I might throw our spouse in there, too. Our spouse can probably affect our mood. Uh, but we have all these external factors coming at us. It's what we allow to affect us. Uh, easier said than done. And, and anyone who is um, 
Yeah, and anyone who's lived knows that. It's easier said than done. But it's a great grounding mechanism of, you know, especially in our relationships with others, if if someone's annoying us or bothering us or we have a hard time working with someone else, um, one, we, we should always be striving to improve that. But two, if that is the case, if they really bug you, why would you ever give them the power to make your day bad? Uh, and I think that's a, a great coaching lesson too because coaches deal with a lot of different parent issues, um, even sometimes some athlete or league issues, whatever it may be. Don't let someone else wreck your day. Sometimes we just need to step up and shake it off. Yeah, I mean, it's again, this sort of notion of uh, agency and having choice over how you respond to those external stimulus. You don't have to be a victim to those external stimulus. You can choose your responses. Um, and one of those choices is to just go, yeah, whatever, move on. You mentioned Dweck before. And, and as you talk mindset, I think you're spot on, Stuart, that I think one issue that we're facing in the world today is we continue to teach our youth what the world has against them, how the world is holding them down. And in many ways, we're teaching a deficit mindset rather than an asset mindset and how lucky we are to be living in this time of the world where truly you can make anything of yourself. You can do anything you want. You do have the world at your fingertips if mm -hmm. you choose to take advantage. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. There's uh, like there's going to be challenges. There's going to be problems along the way. But I think we're teaching too many kids about why they're being held down rather than why they have the opportunity to be lifted up. And 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 to, to sort of um, extend that, I, I agree that I also think there's this slight myth message as well around, like, goes back to your point around sort of how do you identify success and also what the expectations are. So again, I think a high, one of the challenges High expectation and high accountability doesn't always have to be mean. The problem with it, though, is that an individual, if they know that there's high expectations, but they're not given the right support, then that can have a detrimental effect. Because, you know, yeah, let's say you achieve something great and you get the adulation and praise and all those sorts of things. And then the next thing is you fail. Well, what Rex work showed is that they'll, you'll you'll like wither away from that then. You won't want to go, go lean into it again. Whereas if the conversation is, the growth mindset conversation is this notion around actually the failure is where the growth is coming from and actually by leaning into that and learning and developing, we're going to get better. That's the message that I love about Rex work is the, the idea that those around other individuals and the kind of language we use and the articulation, you know, it can be as simple as you must, you did well there. That must be because you're smart fixed or you did well there you must have worked hard at it growth is hugely powerful and being aware of that and understanding how your language creates an environment where people are either going to lean into to struggle and challenge or or shy away from it really critical yeah you, you use the, that word environment which is so powerful because i think it's the significance and importance of all of us establishing that foundation, the foundation of uh, growth, of care and support. If others understand that's who you are and that's your real self and that's your foundation, then those moments of holding someone accountable or having high expectations are viewed as great coaching or it's viewed as great leadership because coach cares about me. He's really pushing me to be better. If you don't have that foundation, th that's, I think, where you go wrong and where the message that is delivered is not the message that's received. No, I mean, it's really important. Now, um, we talked about ha having dirt and shaking it off. You also talk about a mop and bucket attitude. And I, when I saw that, I thought, ah, I think I might know where this is coming from. But yeah, tell me more about that one. Dave Thomas was the founder of Wendy's, and he talked about the importance of having a mop bucket attitude or an MBA. And so uh, as we talk about advanced degrees, Davis, Dave Thomas did not have an advanced degree, but he always said he had his MBA. Uh, and his MBA really was in about example and effort that uh, he wasn't afraid to do whatever work was required to get done. And part of that was setting the example. If a floor needed to be mopped, Dave Thomas, billionaire, 
would be willing to grab the mop bucket and to do the work himself. And I think it uh, also helped ground him and who he was, where he came from, and that no work, that no one is too good for any work. Um, and it's a wonderful leadership story and coaching story for all of us. Like we can pick up the balls. That's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we can rake the field or we can cut the grass, whatever it might be, um, that no work is beneath us as a leader and to set that example. And, and the other part of it is uh, don't ever let effort get in the way of your goals and purpose, right? That's something we can control is that, and that's how I define hard work. Hard work is not letting effort ever get in the way of our success or goals. And who knows what kind of ripple effect that had just by other employees seeing the owner of the franchise, Dave Thomas, grabbing a mop bucket and mopping the floor. That sends a pretty powerful message. No, no. Um, that, that, as a leadership thing, um, when I read that, you made me think of um, there's a, there's another book. I don't know if you've come across it by a guy called James Kerr called Legacy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, about the, the, New, the New Zealand All Blacks, and they have this notion of sweeping the shed. Yep. And they actually physically go through the practice of ensuring that their changing room is left clean before they leave. And it is a, and the fundamental message behind the group mentality and the culture that they have is no one is too good to clean up after themselves. And so many leaders, and we see this a lot with, with, um, with, teenagers with adolescents too um that they have it all wrong they have it flipped they think that once they assume a leadership role or once they become a captain that means that they're now the king of the hill they're at the top of the mountain and that's now their job uh, to be served and, and and everyone else does their bidding they bark out commands and everyone else does it when actually what leadership is and i think this is the greatest mindset shift that we can give our youth in terms of leadership is that leadership is about serving others it's not about being served. And when I work with um, when I work with our students and with our captains, it, if there's nothing else that I get across to them, it's exactly that because I think that's how we transform leadership into the future is getting leaders, coaches, student athletes, captains to understand that leadership is not about being served. It's actually the opposite. It's now our turn to serve others. And I think that's a, a powerful point that you make. Yeah, hundred um... percent. I like this notion as well. I um, don't want to go all the way through the book, but there's a lot in here and there's still plenty for people to get. So don't worry about we're going to go through it all. But um, you talked about kindness and taking care of others, this notion of blacking kindness. I was taken by that notion. So, um, yeah, t t tell me more about that. Kindness is infectious, right? And we never know what kind of an impact that we're having on another person that day, just through our simple words and simple actions. Uh, and so in this example, uh, a farm, someone watching a farmer work uh, in Thailand and is using a water buffalo. And the water buffalo is pulling the plow through the rice fields. And out of nowhere, the farmer jumps off uh, the plow and starts splashing water under this water buffalo. And it just makes that water, you can just see the tension and the release leave the water buffalo and how much that animal appreciates just splashing the kindness on the water uh, on a hot summer day, just to take the time and stop and splash water. And, and it's a wonderful metaphor for all of us about how we can splash water on others to brighten their day and to make their day. Um, and sometimes it's just being mindful of that. You know, we go through life so busy and so hurried. If we can just stop for a moment and take advantage to compliment someone, to open a door for someone, uh, and can trigger that butterfly effect um, that who knows where it ends, it continues out and it expands and brightens other people's days. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, a, again, you know, <laughs> it can too easily be lost, can't it? Very small act, um, you know, can make such a difference um and the random acts of kindness they talk about don't they um and um they go a long way and it like you say it can be the smallest thing um funnily enough because obviously your book's about um influence so where my mind went when you did this is i'm currently doing a course um through a platform that i'm working with um which is about 
influence and denotes the notion of reciprocity. Mm-hmm. And the guy who created the course, he actually created it for the financial industry, financial advisors, uh, but it's applied obviously in lots of different spaces. And um, when I first met him, um, he gave me a little coin. Um, and it was like, I, I said, oh, what's this for? He said, a little present. And I said, oh, well, it's great. That'd be like a little golf marker for me. Uh, and I took it away. I've got it on my side table. And I'm like, I didn't really know why I did it. And then I started doing his course afterwards. And I went, ah, now I know why I did it. Um, and it's this notion of reciprocity. I give you a little thing. It doesn't matter what it is. But just giving you something, an act of kindness or a little a little gift or a uh, a little quote or a something, you know, a cookie, whatever it might be. And that little gift is a kind of a way of putting kindness into the world, not on the basis that it necessarily needs to come back to you. But the principle of reciprocity is such that, Actually, the more you put out, sometimes that stuff does come back to you. Um, and if you don't put it out, don't expect it to come back to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I call it the boomerang effect, right? Mm-hmm. Or you throw some a spiral, you, you'll get a spiral back, or the, the idea of a, of a boomerang coming back to you. Um, and I think it's probably on both sides, too. If we talk about self-fulfilling prophecies, if we treat people poorly, we'll will live up to the expectation that they have of us too, the fundamental attribution error. Uh, but being nice to people doesn't cost anything. And there's a wonderful Bear Bryant story in the book about exactly that. And that's the moral stories. It doesn't cost anything to be nice. And we never know what kind of dividends it's paying. And I would suggest that none of us are doing it for that reason. But it is like a boomerang that it that being kind and giving to others is is something that gives back to us. And I think you see that over and over in coaching and in leadership. Um, and it's something that is uh, cumulative. It builds over time. Yeah, 100%. Um, there's a lot we could talk about. I don't want to necessarily go, in, go through all of it. But if you had a kind of almost like a key method that you wanted or you were, you know, kind of a message that you were hoping that somebody would go away from reading the book. Like, what, what would be your hope, and you know, kind of what impact you think it might have? Yeah, and and so it, it's all stories of leadership, coaching, and teamwork. And I think most of us fit into that category somewhere, like relationships and connections with others, and the ability to successfully work with others. There's that piece, and then there's also the how we lead ourselves. Uh, and I know that through my own work, when I started to understand and uncover my why and my purpose as a leader um, and as a coach, that that gave me more clarity in how I live my life. And, and so it became so much more than leadership and coaching for me. It made me a better coworker. It made me a better spouse, a better husband, uh, a, a better father, a better son, a better brother. And I think that just comes from really getting clarity about who we are and what we're all about. And and you said this earlier, Stuart, that like, that doesn't, I'm not looking for millions of dollars. I'm not looking for worldwide fame. It is being comfortable and understanding of where we are and, and what's most important to us. And for me, that comes down to making a positive difference in the lives of others and the relationships I hold. If in those areas I'm successful, if I have good, strong, loving relationships, and I'm able to make a positive difference on the lives of others, it's a life well lived. And that's what I hope everyone has the opportunity to reflect on as they read the book is, what will be your legacy? And and what do you want accomplished with this one chance we get? Uh, And that it's never too late to think about that. You know, I think sometimes we get stuck in our past and thinking about yesterday, we're we're so fortunate to wake up each day with a new chance and to have a new opportunity to define that day and the next and that we should take advantage of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I love that. It's really powerful. I, I do think the book, as I, as I was um, going through it, I did, do think that, you know, you talk about it being leadership coaching and teamwork, but, you know, you, it's a bit more like a life manual <laughs> in some respect, isn't it? Because there are lessons I, um, in there that can can could resonate with lots of different experiences. Yeah, the box that we want to check for what genre it is doesn't really yeah. exist. And <laughs> there have been times where I actually on self help, I've checked. You know, if, if self help certainly fits the bill. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. 
Hey, listen, um, uh, I mentioned earlier before we started recording that um, there was every chance that the uh, family would come home from school and work and places like that. So they have. I can hear the noise. Um, and I've, I've just realized that there is um, dad taxi to be to be done. Uh, Stuba, as I call it. Um, so uh, I probably need to I like make that. that happen. I like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't get paid, but anyway, there you go. Um, so um, they pay me back in their uh, in their love different and relation. Yeah, yep, cool. yep, they, cool. yeah, in different ways. <laughs> um, listen, uh, I've loved having you on. I think it's been great. Uh, I do. Um, I'm really appreciative that you sent me a copy of the book, and uh, I've I've really enjoyed it. Actually, um, I've got more to get through. Um, uh, it's actually been really useful on lots of levels as well. My wife's opened a new business and, um, you know, it's been really difficult, really challenging. And I said, oh, have a little read of this story. And like, what I love is, is like they're quite short stories, so they've got little messages. And the thing I like about that is that, you know, you can give that to somebody and it's not necessarily like too heavy heavy lifting, but they, oh, okay, I get it. I get where you're coming from. There's something we can talk about. I like it. Well, thank you. And thanks for the conversation. It's been wonderful to connect. And uh, I think we're... Um swimming up the same stream of trying to make a positive difference with this platform. So thanks for the time. And, well, it's definitely been nice as well. I mean, sometimes I go down the skill acquisition rabbit hole, as you know, so it's sometimes nice to come out of that and actually to talk more about the kind of the human to human stuff that's actually probably more important than, yes, we've all got to develop skill and we need to learn more about that. But it's important to also remember that we're, we're trying to connect with people. So I really appreciate uh, you coming on and, uh, and and having a conversation with me about this. All the well, and that might be a great summary takeaway point too, is just like we have all kinds of access and opportunities for the hard skills of sport, right? Mm -hmm. All kinds. There's clinics that are everywhere. In my experiences, it's the soft side and soft skills of sport that really defines who a coach is and what difference they make. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, listen, I love um, I love what you're doing, and I'm I wish you all success with the book and also with your continued success as an athletics director. Um, I think there's, like I said, I mean, I'm just bewildered by that construct you you know you have a setup that's bigger than some governing bodies in this in this country which is crazy um but anyway um uh yeah and um i look forward to the next one because i can imagine there's a next one now you've done this first one you probably thought as you were writing it never again but now you've done it you're probably thinking oh maybe i will do another one once the idea struck so i'm sure i'll get the bug yep but that's <laughs> that's the key to any book it's what, what what's the topic what's the idea yeah. Uh, be before I forget, I can imagine people might be interested in reaching out. Um, I know there's a chasing in chasing dot sorry chasing dash influence dot com website, uh, but is there another route for them to reach out to you if they wanted to talk more about it, or um, you know maybe ask you to come and do some speaking? Yeah, I don't know if that's something you do, but I think you should. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would love to hear from people, um, and and they can reach out to me. The probably the Easiest, quickest way is just uh, my Gmail, Troy Erdahl at gmail.com. So T R O Y U R D A H L at gmail.com. Uh, I'd be happy to, to hear from any, any feedback they have or if there's any way I can help. That's why that's why I do this. Is if I have the opportunity to help, I'd love to do that. Amazing. Troy, it's been great to chat to you and uh, all the best. Thank you.